Okay, guys, this is lecture number four, Settling the Northern Colonies. At the center of the Massachusetts Bay Colony, the Pilgrims, is going to be religion, and namely Protestantism. So we're going to start right here with the Protestant Reformation in 1517. Martin Luther will uh, nail to the you know, church door there in Wittenberg the um, famous 95 Theses, his, his problems with uh, the church at that time. His 95 Theses... On the door, uh, really wasn't as sort of. Um, it's not really such a drop the mic moment, I guess, as people make it out to be. That the church door was sort of like the bulletin board of, um, of the of the Middle Ages or of the 1500s, however you want to think about it. And uh, he was really putting it there for a debate. Uh, and of course, this is going to blow up into a much larger issue. In Switzerland, uh, a guy by the name of John Calvin is going to jump on some of Luther's ideas, and we get what we refer to as Calvinism. And Calvinism will really be what inspires a lot of Puritanism in England, and uh, Scotland, and France, and all other sorts of places. Um, the big thing with Calvinism is this predestination, and I think we're going to see that in the next slide. Predestination deals with the idea that there was nothing you could do on earth that was going to uh, affect your outcome in the afterlife. You were either predetermined by God when you were created to you know, be in heaven or predetermined to be in hell. And so there's a lot of questions about this as we get further along, but one of the things was that they thought that if you were a sort of righteous and successful person in the real world, that this might show your way in the afterlife. You'll also remember that Henry VIII, right, through the through the church out of England, right, May, making himself the head of the church, right? And so when that happens, there's now going to be questions over religion in England. And the Puritans are going to come along, and as you can see right here, they're English religious reformers who wanted to purify English Christianity. They wanted to take the Catholicism out of the, uh, out of the mass or the church service, or whatever you want to call it, the Anglican service, and they wanted it to be more austere, right? They didn't want to have a lot of the, the sort of pomp and circumstance. Now, you might remember King James from settling Jamestown, but he realized as the head of the church and the head of state that this group basically saying that, uh, you know, he was uh, threatening his position, I guess I should put it, as the head of the church, uh, he realized that could also foment maybe revolt against him, and eventually it does. Not necessarily him, but his offspring. And so another group, a group we'll refer to as the Separatists, so the, you have Puritans, okay, and the Puritans have a subgroup inside of them, the Separatists, who wanted to separate from the church. He is basically going to harass them out of England, so that way he does not have to face opposition to his control of the church and of society. We know the separatists as the pilgrims, right? So first they're going to move to Holland. They didn't like their kids, uh, you know, as it says right there, being Dutchified or Dutchification. They didn't like their kids speaking Dutch, living in windmills, playing with tulips, and wearing wooden shoes. Uh, they, wanted, they wanted them to be English. And so they hoped, by returning to England and getting a charter, right, to settle in Virginia, where they could practice their religion as they wanted, and the king would be happy with it, uh, because he wouldn't, they wouldn't be harassing him, right, or questioning him, uh, and so they agree to it. And what you'll see here is going to be uh, basically their route along the bottom. The thing is, is right around here, right, they get blown off course, and so instead of going south and ending up in Virginia, they end up in what we refer to today as Massachusetts. Realizing that they had no legal right to where they were headed, they get together and they sign the Mayflower Compact. Now we're going to go through the Mayflower Compact in class, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but realize that this was an important document in establishing self-government and laws <clears throat> for the pilgrims once they showed up. It also showed that these people were more than willing to govern themselves. So as I said, James the first's offspring here, Charles, is going to have, have a problem on his hands. Um he is going to have to deal with growing uh, discontent from the nobility and from the Puritans. And this is eventually going to lead us to the English Civil War. But what he's going to do is he's going to kick Parliament out and he's going to put the hammer to the Puritans. One of the things the Puritans did was they chose things based on, like, church councils. 
or you know amongst the peers they voted. And so this, yet again, was in opposition to the sort of divine right of kings uh, that Charles firmly believed in. So, another group of Puritans, okay, these are not separatists, but another group of Puritans, are going to leave England, okay, and establish the Massachusetts Bay Colony. <clears throat> as it says right here, this is referred to as the Great English Migration, some 70,000 refugees, right, or as it, the picture actually says, over this whole time period, 189,000 are going to flee, right, uh, England, and some 70,000 end up in the New War in, say, North America, not in the Caribbean. One of the interesting things about the Massachusetts Bay Colony was, unlike, say, Virginia, right, the Virginia Company, who left its charter in England, and that was where it was headquartered, right, but they, you know, remember that they insured the rights of those people, the Massachusetts Bay Colony brought their charter with them, thus establishing their colony, and then the home office for that colony being in Massachusetts. So there was no one back in London, say, telling them what to do. Except for, eventually, the king, but that's down the road. So I didn't say it because I was trying to get through it fast, but William Bradford, right, is going to be the leader of the Plymouth, uh, the Plymouth Colony, right, the Pilgrims. He's going to be the guy that kind of is in charge, helps pen the Mayflower Compact. Um, another guy that's super important for this is going to be John Winthrop. John Winthrop is going to be the governor of the Massachusetts Bay Colony. And as they get um, to the coast of Massachusetts, he is going to write a model of Christian charity, another document that we're going to break down in class. But what it is, it's a pep talk right, for these colonists uh, as they're about to embark on establishing this colony. And it's an important document. It, it establishes a lot of stuff that we're going to look, look at as we go through American history. As it says right there, the Massachusetts Bay Colony became the biggest and most influential colony of Massachusetts with Boston and Salem and really becomes a center for uh, the population in that northern New England area and it's really going to push the politics in New England as well. So as it pointed out here, right, uh, as I pointed out earlier, excuse me, that the church members usually voted for things. If you were not a member of the church, you could not vote in the Massachusetts Bay Colony. And as it says right there, it was not a democracy. Even though there was voting, you know, a lot of times the governor had the final say, which was Winthrop. And so it was really more of like a theocracy uh, than we'll see in, say, in Virginia and other the southern colonies that were very much more democratic. Now, they were run by the wealthy landowners, but it was more fair in that instance, where in this instance, right, it was more of a theocracy, the church and the state were tied together. We'll talk more about the Quakers uh, in the next lecture, but basically the Quakers uh, and other groups that didn't fall under the Puritan sort of idea are going to be persecuted. One such person that's going to be persecuted is Anne Hutchinson. She believed basically that, uh, as it says here in her textbook, she claimed that a holy life was no sure sign of salvation, and that the truly saved need not to bother, need not bother to obey the law of either God or man, right? And this is assertion, as it says, is referred to as antinomianism, which means in Greek against the law, which was big time heresy for the Puritans. Now, besides this idea, she was also popular, right? And so uh, she would hold meetings in her house and like would preach and do all this sort of stuff that in you know 1600s Massachusetts Massachusetts Bay Colony she uh, was really challenging the patriarchal sort of system now as it says right there they're gonna bring her to trial and they're gonna banish her to Rhode Island we'll talk about Rhode Island here in a second but Rhode Island as it says right there uh, or it doesn't say there Rhode Island will be where all the sort of discontents uh, people that were not Puritan would move now, as it says, she left Rhode Island and then moved to New York, where her family was killed with Indians. Uh, and John Winthrop basically is going to write that it was God's will that she died, uh, to give you context for how these guys thought. So, Rhode Island. Okay, Roger Williams right, is going to also have sort of not consistent views with the Puritans. As he says right there, he challenged clergymen to break a clear break with the Church of England and the legality of the Bay Colony's charter. Basically... He didn't agree with the Puritan idea of purifying the church, right? Um, he wanted, to, yet again, to be more like a separatist. And so he's going to build a Baptist church in Providence, Rhode Island, 
okay, which Rhode Island, he is going to basically uh, make a deal with the Native Americans and treat them respectfully uh, to s- establish his colony. Um, basically, he established complete freedom of religion. So Jews, Catholics, non-Puritans, uh, anyone could move there. There was, there was basically, there was no oaths, as it says. Uh, the Quakers moved in there. It becomes the most liberal colony and even the most stubborn colony, right? Because it's going to be a lot of free thinkers in Rhode Island. New England spreads out. Uh, the fertile Connecticut River area attracted sprinkling of Dutch and English settlers in 1635. It says Hartford's compounded. Uh, you're also going to have people from Massachusetts that wanted to make their own go of it, move into Connecticut, right? As it says right there, New Haven was founded by the Puritans. Uh, and the big famous thing, like kind of like Maryland's Act of Toleration is its famous document, uh, Connecticut's is going to be the fundamental orders, right? And as it says right there, basically uh, it allowed for the democratic control uh, by the substantial citizens. Remember, yet again at this time, uh, voting is often limited to landowners or a special group of people uh, in most places. It's not going to be until we get to the like 1800s that we see like the idea of uh, free men without land being able to vote. In this map, you can see the influence of the Massachusetts Bay, right? The blue line there, colony was absorbed by Massachusetts Bay, namely New Hampshire and Maine, right? And then also how Rhode Island and Connecticut and and it says New Haven, but New Haven, right, becomes part of Connecticut, are all founded by former members of the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Take a read. Uh, I'm not going to read it at you. So Puritans versus Indians. Uh, the Puritans and the Indians didn't get along, as you read in the Howard Zinn chapter. Um, the Wampanoag Indians, okay, are going to be the ones that meet with the pilgrims, or those separatists we talked about, and Tonto, right, is, or not Tonto, Squanto, excuse me, is going to show up uh, to help them out, right? And as it says right there, uh, 75% of the people had basically died from epidemic disease. So the area was open because of that disease. 1637, hostile Indians and whites explodes into the Pequot War. And we're going to see with this Pequot War uh, how ruthless the English are going to be at dealing with the Native Americans. Four decades of uneasy peace are going to follow the Pequot War. We'll look at a primary source from the Pequot War. Basically, the, the villagers went out, or the militia went out and like burned down their village and shot them as they ran away. Um... As it says right there, praying towns are set up. Realize that the English attempts at converting Native Americans is much, much smaller than the French or the Spanish. Uh, this sort of brutality is going to call for, it says King Philip, which is a guy by the name of Metacombe. Uh, the English called him King Philip. Uh, he's going to make some alliances, right? And then go on the warpath against the colonists. Uh, as your textbook says... Uh, 52 Puritan towns had been attacked and 12 were destroyed entirely. Um, so this is going to be a, a long, drawn-out thing, as it says right there. It's going to last over a year. And eventually the colonists are going to put down the put down King Philip's war, and they're going to sell his wife and children into slavery and then behead him and carry his head on a pike back to Plymouth. Now, what's going to happen is it's going to slow down the expansion of the Puritans, or the settlers, or however you look at it in New England, but it'll be basically a lasting, situ- a lasting, as it says right there, defeat on Indians in New England. They're going to basically be on the uh, defensive now for the rest of the time that we see this sort of engagement. You're going to see the New England Confederation, right? It's basically going to be formed for defense. As it says right there, it's a Puritan club. It's going to be like a precursor, as we're going to see, to the Dominion of New England. <clears throat> Distracted by the English Civil War, what's going to happen, right, is uh, you're going to have James II basically be overthrown, right? Um, and the English Civil War is going to basically bring about, yet again, benign neglect, and we'll see, what this, again, it will be called salutary neglect in a future slide. And they're basically going to, the colonists, excuse me, are going to have their own independence, and they're going to make their own decisions, and they're going to skirt whatever laws they want to skirt, and everything is going to be sort of happy over in the colonies. Now, eventually, we're going to see King Charles II is going to be restored, and he's going to want to impose much more active management of the colonies, namely in the name of 
the old, the, not old dominion, the dominion of New England. You're going to see a series of political moves here to basically royalize a lot of the, the charters so that now they're controlled directly by the king. This is going to begin to put pressure on the colonists. So here, as you can see, it says in 1686, royal authority created the Dominion of New England, as you can see in the picture off to the side. One benefit from the Dominion was defensive stuff, but its main thing, was it says right here, is the navigation laws. Right? It wanted to enforce the navigation laws. Navigation laws were effectively mercantile laws that said basically you had to trade only with England. And this was really to start trying to hem in uh, the Dutch that were in New York. Also, as you're going to see here, Edmund Andros is going to be the uh, governor of the Dominion of New England. Now, eventually, um, following James, you're going to get, I think, Charles II. And when this happens, um, the people are not going to be happy. And they're going to overthrow him and ask William and Mary to come be the king and, in king and queen of England. This is what they refer to as the Glorious Revolution. Um, when this occurs, okay, yet again, there's going to be more uh, neglect, if you will, salutary neglect for the people of the colonies to smuggle and do what they will. Also, as we'll see in future slides, uh, William will drag the colonists into the Seven Years' War, which becomes the French and Indian War in the new world. All right, guys, well, make sure you look at the key terms and homework associated with this. I'm sure it's due relatively soon, and I'll see you in class.